Low stock alert. This is not a drill. Last week I announced the CZ's World U2's vinyl figure with the stipulation that once these things are gone, they're gone. And uh, they're about to be gone. So if you want to be one of the lucky few that gets to own this piece of YouTube and horror history, time is running out. So make sure you click the link in the description and reserve yours today. When you're making a movie centered around dreams, you're gonna spend a lot of time in bedrooms. A Nightmare on Elm Street gets it right, making each location feel like a real teenager's room. But if you look closely, you start to notice one element that repeats over and over. Birds. Why are there so many birds? As I've discussed in the past, when director Wes Craven wasn't brewing up nightmares, he spent his free time bird watching. Scream 2022 made an homage to Craven by putting the sound of bird calls under his memoriam and filling the house with bird artwork. In A Nightmare on Elm Street, there's a goose statue in Tina's living room, her mom's room has peacock silhouettes and a swan and pigeon ornament on the shelves, Nancy's kitchen contains a chicken on the wall and a rooster above the fridge. Glenn's room has a lot of weird stuff, including this picture of three baby chicks with Nancy's name on it. Did she paint this for him or did he paint it in honor of her, then hang it up in his room? Glenn's mom can also be seen holding a newspaper. The headline reads, birds get names, but only three. This seems to be related to Craven's hobby because a bird watcher will usually try to identify or name the birds that he spots. Finally, and perhaps most ominously, is the toy vulture perched on Glenn's bed, a species of bird known for feasting on the remains of the dead, which is what Glenn is about to become. Like a bird, the nightmare that Wes Craven crafted on the silver screen would take flight as one of the iconic slashers of all time. To learn the meaning behind Nancy's English lesson, the secret hidden on this sign and the true explanation of what happens to Nancy Thompson, then stick around, and whatever you do, don't fall asleep. One, two, Freddy's coming for you. Three, four, better lock your door. Five, six, welcome to things you missed. Today I am covering A Nightmare on Elm Street. If there's any movie that needs no introduction, this is probably it. The film made 51 times its budget when it was released in the 80s, put New Line Cinema on the map, they're now referred to as the house that Freddy built, launched the career of actor Johnny Depp, and took home two Saturn Awards in 1985, and was selected for preservation by the Library of Congress for cultural significance in 2021. I guess that is an introduction. But nearly 40 years later, there still seem to be a litany of interpretations. What is the film trying to say with its references to religion, literature, and relationships? Who are surfers number one and number two? Let's cut in to the things you missed. The film begins inside the dream of Tina. She's in a damp hallway and a lamb can be seen running across it, the first of the film's religious symbols. This is representative of the sacrificial lamb, a symbol in many major religions where a lamb is killed in order to save others for the greater good. In Judaism, the lamb's blood is smeared on the doors of those who are to be passed over by the angel of death on Passover. In Islam, it's believed that God provided Abraham with a lamb to sacrifice in place of having to sacrifice his own son. In Christianity, the sacrifice of Jesus is known as the Lamb of God. Not that that's Lamb of God. The image here indicates that Tina will be sacrificed in the name of helping another character, in this case Nancy Thompson, survive. After waking up, Tina grabs her crucifix off the wall for protection, essentially equating Freddy Krueger with the devil, a theme that would persist through this movie and notably one other. When Nancy sleeps over the next night to offer Tina some comfort, the crucifix falls on her. Later, we see the ceiling warp above her as Freddy tries to cross the threshold into the real world. But then he retracts, probably after seeing Nancy with the crucifix. By 1984, when A Nightmare on Elm Street came out, the trope of the virgin final girl had already been established with the likes of Laurie Strode and Alice Hardy. But it's also important to examine the reason that the trope exists. It was a morality play. Early slashers were the evolution of campfire stories warning kids about improper behavior. That's right. Now you're no longer a virgin. <laughs> now you gotta die. Those are the rules. But where did the idea that sex is supposedly immoral come from in the first place? Primarily from Christianity, whose Bible only details its founders losing their virginity after marriage. In this case, Tina and her boyfriend Rod get it on in her parents' room, in stark contrast to Nancy and her boyfriend Glenn, who follow the rules by sleeping in separate rooms entirely, much to Glenn's dismay. As a result, Tina is the first to die, and when she comes face to face with Freddy, she begs for forgiveness from her maker for breaking rule number one. Please, God. This. God. Her pleas are not answered, however. But by the end of the movie, neither are Nancy's. And now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. 
When she goes into the final dream to face Freddy, she finds Tina's crucifix and takes it along with her, but it doesn't help her. It is actually her refusal to believe in Freddy that ultimately defeats him. It certainly flies in the face of movies like The Exorcist or The Conjuring, in which the character's faith helps them overcome the evil. In Nancy's case, it's quite the opposite. In an interview in Fangoria magazine for his 2010 film My Soul to Take, Wes Craven confirms that he is an atheist, saying that if there is a god, he doesn't really intervene in the horrible things that happen on Earth very much at all, so we kind of have to embody it all ourselves. And I think that's what Nancy is doing here. She doesn't receive divine intervention, and her parents are no help either, so she decides to take matters into her own hands. Unlike many final girls and horror protagonists, she proactively goes after her stalker, not just trying to survive, but trying to put an end to it. In the final dream sequence, she descends into the boiler room, Freddy's domain, which seems to represent hell. She goes down this spiral staircase, but when she encounters Freddy, she flees and goes down the same spiral staircase again, suggesting that she's in an infinite loop or eternal damnation. However, she's able to break the loop and inexplicably lands outside her house, showing that the nightmare will follow her wherever she goes. When audiences first saw A Nightmare on Elm Street, Tina was the first character the film followed, so people assumed that she was the main character until her early departure. This is an homage to Marion Crane, the first girl that we follow in Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. That movie that gets brought up in nearly every episode of Things You Missed because every horror filmmaker wants to pay their respects to one of the greats. Even her hair resembles the way that Janet Leigh's hair was styled in Psycho. Tina's actress, Amanda Weiss, has confirmed that her character was a nod to Hitchcock. There's another horror movie reference later on, when Nancy tries to keep herself awake by watching The Evil Dead on TV. This is actually a response by director Wes Craven because Sam Raimi, the director of The Evil Dead, put a poster for Craven's The Hills Have Eyes in the basement of the cabin in The Evil Dead. This would set off a chain of events of the two directors cross-referencing each other's work, much like Craven's back and forth with Kevin Smith during the Scream era. And on the topic of people named Kevin, some of you may have seen this missing poster at the Springwood police station and found it strangely familiar. if you want to be one of the lucky few that gets to own this piece of YouTube and horror history, time is running out. The figure features my classic horror history getup, complete with Overlook Hotel carpet pattern tie with the iconic CZ's World logo mask. There's so many fun details, like the book of horror history, the goatee in all of its true glory, and wrapped up in this beautifully designed box. It's definitely the most devious figure that YouTube's has released, and it's sure to be a collector's item if you're a CZ's World fan or a horror collector of any kind. You're not going to want to miss out on this. This figure is going to change your life, okay? I mean, you're going to be buried with this thing, most likely. But these are almost gone, so make sure you click the link in the description and reserve yours today. When I saw the missing poster for Kevin Collins, my first instinct was to check the credits, thinking that it might be a crew reference Easter egg. What I found was that this was actually a real missing kid in 1984, and although this poster was featured in both A Nightmare on Elm Street and The Terminator, Kevin was, sadly, never found. Despite that one being a dud, I was still able to find a few crew reference easter eggs. Or at least crew adjacent easter eggs. Nancy's English teacher is played by Lynn Shay, the sister of the movie's producer, Robert Shea. Yes, it's the same Lynn Shea who went on to be an insidious. Robert Shea's daughter is also referenced. Due to Nancy's sleep issues, her mother takes her to a sleep clinic called the Katya Institute, which is named after Katya Shea. Having a producer for a dad has its perks, as does marrying the director. The nurse at the Institute is played by Wes Craven's then-wife, Mimi Craven. The in-universe name of this character is Dory Cooper, which is an alternate spelling of Dory Cooper, the film's set dresser. The Sleep Institute, however, is not much help. She's into REMs now. Later on, there's also a cop named Hunsley, likely named after the set decorator, Anne Hunsley. Throughout the movie, Nancy struggles with this thin line between being awake and being asleep. Every time she begins to doze off, Freddy attempts to cross over into her world. At the end of the movie, that line between sleep and awake is blurred, when she thinks that she's woken up from a nightmare, only to find that she's still in Freddy's domain. The Dreamverse reality theme is harped on in her English class while they're learning about Shakespeare. What is seen is not always what is real. According to Shakespeare, there was something operating in nature, perhaps inside human nature itself that was rotten. Also written on the chalkboard is a quote from Cinna the Poet from the play Julius Caesar. I dreamt tonight that I did feast with Caesar, and things unluckily charge my fantasy. I have no will to wander forth of doors, yet something leads me forth." Cinna is telling about a dream where his feast with Caesar turned dark and ominous, a foreshadowing of the character's death, not unlike the nightmares that Rod and Tina both experienced before their own deaths. As Nancy toes the line between dream and reality, there's one other character who mirrors her struggle, and that is her mom, Marge Thompson. Marge lives in a constant limbo between being sober and being drunk, constantly accessing bottles of gin hidden around 
on the house. Marge and Nancy's father, Donald, seem to be divorced, and it's not hard to imagine that the aftermath of their participation of the lynching of Freddy Krueger had something to do with it. The alcoholism and the divorce have put a strain on Marge's relationship with her daughter. Nancy hides most of her life from her mom and is scornful in what she does share. She sneaks her boyfriend in through the window, lies about her whereabouts during Tina's death, does what she can to hide her sleep issues, including hiding a secret coffee machine under her bed to get some caffeine under her mom's nose. Marge is constantly trying to get Nancy to sleep, but she's obviously afraid to do so. You are going to get some sleep tonight if it kills me. The irony is not lost here. Although this would change as later sequels added to the Freddy lore, in this scenario, Freddy Krueger represents the damage caused by an alcoholic parent. Throughout the movie, we see her rebelling and shutting her mom out in order to protect herself against Freddy. Their relationship is summed up perfectly at the Sleep Disorder Institute when Marge begs for her daughter's trust. It's not you I don't trust, it's just... She can't even think of anything else to say. Nancy later calls her mother out for using drinking to numb her feelings, to which she gets slapped in the face, a clear-cut sign of abuse. Kids who have dealt with fighting parents or abuse oftentimes find that it manifests in their own adult relationships with feelings of shame. They try to hide their own desires because they've seen the turmoil that it caused their own families, and associate those desires with feelings of pain. This is illustrated in Nancy's reluctance with her relationship with Glenn, but also in the bathtub scene. She's locked herself away in the bathroom, and she's dozing off in the tub, thinking about who knows what, when Freddy reaches his clawed hand up out of the water between her legs, very much representative of the desires she's trying to repress. When her mom knocks on the door and wakes her up, Freddy is suddenly sent away, indicative of Nancy's shame. But she dozes off again, which leads to her getting pulled under by Freddy and nearly drowning in her dream. When her mom comes into the bathroom to help, Nancy is screaming at her and claims nothing is wrong. It seems like strange behavior, because there is clearly something very wrong every time she falls asleep. But her damaged parental relationship causes her to hide these issues away. On the topic of adult relationship metaphors, there's one scene where Nancy goes into her dream to find Freddy, with Glenn keeping watch over her to wake her up if she runs into trouble. Glenn is the one person she feels she trusts to do this, but he falls asleep. And and Freddy finds her and chases her back to her bedroom where they engage in a physical confrontation, which involves, I'll just say, a lot of rolling around on the bed as Glenn is blissfully unaware, a few feet away. Once again, this represents Nancy fighting her inner demons. She secretly craves intimacy, but fears ending up in a relationship that'll go south like her parents did. She comes home one day to find her house completely locked down with metal bars over the windows. Her freedom and agency is literally being restricted, just as she often finds herself trapped in a dream with Freddy Krueger. At one point, through the bars, Nancy waves to her father, who is investigating Glenn's death across the street. The scene is symbolic of what some kids go through during a divorce, a parent becoming overly territorial and shutting the child out from his or her other parent in fear of losing them. In an earlier scene, Rod is suspected of being the killer, and Nancy's father has the police force keep an eye on her, which quickly helps them find and catch Rod. Nancy accuses her father of using her to get to Rod, and this is another symptom of what sons or daughters might go through in a messy divorce. This is known as putting kids in the middle, and often consists of one parent using their child for leverage in the divorce proceedings. As I mentioned, her parents are no help to her, and Nancy tries to take matters into her own hands. In the final scene, she thinks she's defeated Freddy for good. She tells her mom that she loves her and they make up, but before long, she finds that she's trapped by Freddy once again. To me, this last scene hammers the point home. Being a minor with an addict parent is a nightmare that you can't wake up from. As for surfer number one and surfer number two in the credits, I have no idea. There's no surfers in the movie as far as I can tell. I know Robert England, who plays Freddy Krueger, used to be a very active surfer and was in a surfing movie called Big Wednesday in 1978. Maybe there's a deleted and lost scene where Freddy goes after some kids on a surfboard? It sounds like something that actually wouldn't be that out of the question in one of the weird and wacky Elm Street sequels, which, by the way, I'm planning on covering in future episodes of Things You Missed. You'll find those videos in the playlist on the left when they're released. So if you need a little more Freddy in your life, remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring the death bell for all notifications, and I will see you in the next one, assuming we both survive.